you first. So, so welcome everyone to the to the Radnet um, uh, City of London seminar series. This is the ninth talk in the series. Um, so far, they've been very successful, very well received. Um, thank you all for coming uh, today. Um, obviously, the aim of this seminar series is really to bring together people, you know, sort of cross disciplinary um, way from sort of clinical and, and non clinical backgrounds, really in the, the radiation space to to sort of understand a few key uh, sort of cutting edge topics and and and, some, and hear about some of the really exciting work that's going on globally. Uh, and so um, we're, we're really happy to have uh, Jacob Scott, who's an associate professor of radiation oncology at the Cleveland Clinic here to give his talk today. If I could just remind you all that the, the meeting will be recorded. And uh, if you could mute your microphones uh, and turn off your cameras uh, while the talk is, is going on. Um, but please do, um, uh, you know, raise your hand um, sort of after the talk um, and, and you obviously you can ask questions. And if you've got questions you'd like to pose during the talk, please put them in the in the chat box and either you can I'll call on you to, to ask them yourself or I can ask them on your behalf. Um, so my name is Crispin Hardy. I'm a clinical academic at, at, uh, at UCL and um, really excited uh, always to read uh, Jacob Scott. He's also very uh, um you know, active on, on, on sort of social media and definitely worth um, following. Um, Jacob's going to give us a talk today on uh, quantifying the biological effect of radiation with genomics uh, or GARD uh, and a path to personalised radiotherapy dose. Um, Jake is one of these people who always makes you feel quite boring. I, I had a very, you know, um, went straight from med school to, to working, whereas uh, Jacob came through uh, um, uh, working on the submarines for the um, US Navy uh, and has a physics and engineering background and then got into into to medicine later on and he was did his training both at the the, the sort of well-known math uh, oncology department at the Moffat Cancer Centre as, as well as doing his PhD in Oxford uh, and is now an associate professor at uh, at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, and I'll stop talking there and Jacob and, and let you let you um, talk to us about about your presentation thanks very much for agreeing to speak today cheers Crispin thanks very much uh, I'm going to share screen and bear with me, everyone. We just figured out the sharing sound. So it's very important that I share sound for a number of reasons. And then also um, want to make sure, oops, so this happened last time as well. Hold on a second. Um, all right, can everyone, Crispin, is this the first slide? Uh, yes, that's the first slide, yeah. All right, cool. Um, Right, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I wanna say a few, I'm gonna have a couple of minutes of philosophy at the beginning of the talk because I have, a, um, I have the microphone. Um, and I think it's some important things I wanna say before I talk about science. One, um, please feel free to share anything you see today in the talk as widely as you like. Um, the point of us doing all this research is to help folks. And if the message doesn't reach uh, the world, then, then, then it doesn't matter, does it? Uh, and I also want to have a couple of, of props in the background that I think are important. One, I have some toys here because I'm a bit, a bit of a fidgeter and an ADD type. So um, sometimes I lose my thread and if I do, just put me back on. But that also means that um, I actually would love to be interrupted with questions. So if you do have a question, Crispin, if, if someone puts one in, feel free to interrupt me and ask. And then also I've got, um, I think, an important diversity statement from my lab. And I want to just show everyone. So take a peek at the screen there. And it's, um, it's a strong statement that I think we post all over. And it says that Black Lives Matter, love is love, science is real, feminism is feminism's for everyone, immigrants are welcome. Uh, and further, I'd like to include other diverse groups, disabled folks in STEM and otherwise. And uh, I think it's really, really important to me that, that you all know that I feel that way. Um, it's been a weird couple of years. And, and I think that the, the only way for us to get out of all this mess in the world is to is to accept each other for who we are and work together. And, and that's why we're here. So just wanna throw that out there to begin with. That's my philosophy and um, it's important to me. So anyway, um, you can follow me there, see things. And, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about how I think uh, we have a path forward that exists now to personalizing radiotherapy dosing. Uh, and in particular, I'm gonna talk about a series of papers, uh, three of them um, in which we talk about a method by which to calculate what I'm calling a genomic dose or the genomically adjusted radiation dose guard and how to how to think about using that going forward. Um, I would, I would one disclosure to make financially, which is that the, the guard is something I co-invented as is RxRSI, which I'll talk about. And there's a company that's been spun up around those things um, by a friend of mine called Javier and I'm a consultant there and he um, gave me a part of the company for having helped out with the intellectual property bits. 
Um, I also think we should all disclose something to ourselves scientifically and academically, which is that as a field, we're still treating patients based on experiments done in rams and rabbits like a hundred years ago. And this is a picture for the, the clinical oncologists and radiation oncologists that I pulled directly from, from our Hall Bible, um, which is a, a ram who's having his testes irradiated. And he looks, you can tell there's a couple of visual clues in the picture that remind you where these experiments were done in Paris. Um, and, and really what happened was they figured out um, at what point the scrotum skin turned red and at what point the testes stopped producing spermatozoa and hormones. And that was sort of the general basis of why we do two gray per day and why we do something like 40, 50, 60 gray as the standard doses. And I want everyone just to let that sink in for a second. We're just this amazing, beautiful field. We help patients so, so, so much, but we're really comfortable with that. We're really comfortable with the idea that we can go to our clinic, which I'm gonna to go to in a few hours and help people with these dosing strategies. That's good, right? It's good that we're helping people but we need to get uncomfortable before we can adapt and grow. No change is preceded by sitting comfortably. All change is preceded by discomfort. So I'm hoping during the course of this talk that I can make you all progressively more uncomfortable with what we do. Again, I wanna stress what we do is amazing. We help so many people and cure so many people. Something like half of all, all, all cancer cures are based on radiation therapy, what we do, because we do it well but I, I'm gonna argue that we can do better and we can do better now. We don't need some new immunotherapy drug, though they're lovely. We don't need some new targeted therapy, though they're amazing. We need to do what we do better. And I think we can cure tens of thousands more patients this year with what we have in our hands now, if we just have a rethink. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm also just gonna briefly introduce to what I do with the rest of my life, which is run a, a laboratory here called Theory Division. Uh, which is really a, a, a combined mathematical uh, wet and dry lab full of a bunch of amazing folks. We use a bunch of different mathematical tools through, from hybrid cellular automata models and game theory. Um, and also we, we grow bugs and tumors in the lab and we, we do sequencing and we, we track things with cameras and, and fluorescent proteins to, to write down models to really think, think about why our therapies fail because all of our therapies do work and then they stop because evolution figures out a solution because it's smart. Um, and so we think about this all, all the time. And, and my team, I wanna put front and center because I think I can't do any of this without a group, group of smart folks around me. And this is a bit outdated. So there's some folks here that have moved on and graduated and this is missing some folks who are here now. But, but front and center is, is, a, is a toy, is, a, is a, a cartoon from the eighties when I was growing up called Voltron. And this might seem silly, but um, it's important to me as well. I think that the, the central dogma of this cartoon was that there's these folks that lived on some planet somewhere and it was often beset by, by bad guys. Um, and, and every once in a while, like when like so a low level bad guy would come to the planet, um, the, the folks would get into one of these robot lions that you can maybe see in the pictures and they would fly out and defeat the bad guy. But when the going got really tough and the bad guy was really bad, all the lions flew into near planetary orbit transformed into part of this robot and formed this massive robot called Voltron and a sword appeared and, 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 he, and the robot sliced up the bad guy. And I think that our lab and, and indeed our field, is a, this is an analogy for that, right? Because we've got a really bad problem and we need people who are mathematicians, who are computer scientists, who are physicists, who are biologists, who are oncologists, who are clinicians, who are pediatricians to come together and work together to defeat this issue. And so I like to think of our lab as sort of a microcosm for that. And I think that it's also a heck of a lot of fun to work together. Um, and, and, and I wanna sort of tell you how I think about cancer as a whole before we start into the radiation stuff. So I, I really think about cancer. So my original training was in physics as an undergraduate. And I really think about cancer as a complex adaptive evolving system, right? So it's not just a bunch of cells. And so this, this cartoon figure, what you're seeing in front of you is kind of a, a mishmash, a mashup, if you will, to use the parlance of the day, the parlance of our time, a mashup of a Mueller plot on the left. This is an ice cream cone. And what you see is sort of this widening cone of, of things. You can imagine the height of that is something like the population number of cells and the colors represent different tumor types, different clones, if you will. Uh, you might call them different species of a different tumor. And so as an ecologist or a theoretical ecologist, I think of these moments when a new clone arises, a new resistant clone arises, almost like a speciation event. 
And so, you know, you think about cancer starting as a single clone, moving through time, and really you have all these beautiful, beautiful speciation events, and you end up with this, this incredible heterogeneity and diversity when we biopsy the tumor, right? So we stick a needle in then, and we try to say something about what we see. But really, I think the interesting stuff has already happened and the, the things we need to think about are still going to happen. And so with most of the time in the laboratory, I don't think about characterizing these individual alterations that we see. I'm a little bit afraid of that actually, right? Because this, this is something like a lamppost problem. If, you're, if you stick a needle in something and you ask what's important, but what you're looking for is what other people have already told you might be important. You're sort of suffering from this fallacy of the lamppost, which is if you've lost your keys in a dark field and there's one lamppost in the very middle, you're most, like, most likely to look under the lamppost. But there's no reason a priori that your keys might be under the lamppost. The same is here. There's no reason a priori that EGFR or ALK could be the only causative mechanisms. As a matter of fact, we know these are only something like 5% of cancers that benefit from targeted therapies. So we're looking for this 5% of alterations when really there's this beautiful heterogeneity that could, that could be causing the rest. And we're often blinding ourselves to it. So really in our lab, we, we think about these these moments in evolutionary time, we try to think about what causes these branch points, these speciation events, and how we can maybe bias them in some way. We think about what happens at the end. You know, there's this phenomenon between bats and birds. A shotgun or a net is a great way to treat both, but they're wildly genomically different. The same is true of many different cancer, cancer types. You might have cisplatin sensitivity to a bladder cancer and an anal cancer. And they're nothing alike genomically. And so, and radiation sensitivity certainly fits in there. And we'll talk about that. And then there's also this beautiful interplay between the species within the cancer ecosystem and thinking about these things in terms of these evolutionary processes and in terms of the ecological and evolutionary models that you could use to write them down is sort of where I spend most of my time and headspace. Um, and I, I also just wanted to throw out one more philosophical point, which is that, you know, I, I've had a couple of good ideas in my life, but, but none of them ever happened sitting at work, staring at a screen. They all happened talking to people over a coffee or at the pub, walking in the woods. And so I think that we also suffer in our field a little bit the fallacy of productivity versus work. Um, and I think it's important to, to, live, to live your life and, and, and have a, a free mind and, and have some empty time as well, because I think that's when the, the real uh, insights can come. So anyways, so that, that's all what I do in my uh, non-radiation time. So, so what about right now? What, about, what am I going to talk about today? How can we truly personalize radiation therapy with existing knowledge? So there's that XRT sensitivity I've written in down there. Which of these clones code for that and how can we think about that? So I'm going to talk today about some work I've done largely with Javier Torres Roca, but also with some students that I'll talk about over the course of the talk to really think about how to personalize radiation dosing now. And we're going to use a little bit of maths that's going to be uh, familiar to most of the clinical oncologists and radiobiologists of the room. And we're going to use some, um, some gene expression, and we're going to use some um, statistics, some, some uh, epidemiology and health statistics, and we're going to try to figure out what we can do to move forward. So um, we have largely been live, left out of this whole precision medicine era, which is a drag, because as you know, our medical oncology colleagues um, are making great strides, right? And so this all started with trastuzumab and, and now there's many, many others, or you could argue it started with imatinib, but, but now there's many sort of biology driven uh, rather, than, rather than cytotoxic therapies that are out there. And in particular in cancer, we have Oncotype, we have Mamaprint, we have Decipher, we have a number of methods by which not just to look at mutation and targeted therapy, but also to look at sort of signaling state to understand what decisions we can make. But we don't have any of this in radiation therapy yet. There's a, there's a, we all have the sort of, we've seen Portos and a couple of ideas where we can say maybe you do or you, you would or wouldn't benefit from radiation therapy. But we don't have anything that really tells us about individual biology of a tumor and what to do when it comes to our radiation. But anyone who spent any time in a radiation oncology clinic has seen this picture, right? So these, these are actually the first three women I treated as an attending physician. Um, and I, I do sarcoma with my clinical time. And these are literally the first three women I treated. They all three had right thigh undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas. They all three got post-operative radiation therapy to 66 gray. And they all three had wildly different normal tissue responses. And everyone, if you spent a month 
being a clinical clinician in radiation oncology has, has seen has seen this, has seen a heterogeneity in normal tissue response. And so we all know deep down that tumors and people respond wildly differently to the same doses of radiation. Yet we give everyone the same dose and we're very comfortable with that. I want this picture to sink in and I want you to start becoming uncomfortable. It's obvious that these women didn't need the same dose of radiation, but I had no idea which was which going forward. As a matter of fact, here I had an Irish woman, a Swedish woman, and an African-American woman. And the Irish one's in the middle, the Swedish one's in the right, and the African-American's in the left. Could I have guessed this? No. Um, so, so some of you in the audience might be complaining that, that radiation is personalized. And I will say that medical physics has done an absolutely incredible job over the years. And I have a fun story about this picture. So I gave, this, I gave a, a version of this talk um, a few years ago in, at Peter McCallum in, in Melbourne. And um, the person who made this woodcut was in the audience, which is pretty cool. But, but really over the years, even since I was a registrar 10, ten years ago, not as, as my students call it way back when, um, even since then we've made we've made drastic improvements right and i'm not even showing a vmat plan here so anatomic personalization is something we've done an incredibly good job of we can now deliver dose in an incredibly precise way sorry in an incredibly accurate way anatomically sparing normal tissues in ways we never were able to do hyperfractionating in ways we could never have imagined because of normal tissue constraints and it's really an amazing thing we've managed to do but the but to date personalized radiation has only meant anatomic personalization, the shape of our dose, not the dose. And so now I'm gonna show you um, who I think is the greatest superhero in our field. This is uh, Zarina, the pirate fairy on the left. And I'm gonna show you about a 15 second video. For those of you who don't know, this is from the Tinkerbell Disney World. That's Fairy Gary on the right. He's basically Zarina's line manager. These are dust keeper fairies. So they're the ones who are in charge of pixie dust. And Zarina, I like to think of myself a lot like Zarina. She's sort of a personal hero of mine. And, and I showed this actually to a patient once. Um, I had an MIT electrical engineer come in who I was treating post-op and, and he asked me, or actually I was treating him pre-op. He was, he was asking me why I was gonna give him 25 fractions of two gray each. And he said almost exactly what this um, young dust keeper fairy is going to say in this video. So, so turn your volumes up, it should work. No, oh, shucks. Um, I want you all to imagine that the, each pixel of fairy dust is like a, a fraction of radiation in this video. Wow. Be careful now. After last time, I'm sure I don't have to remind you just how potent and powerful. No touch. I promise. Atta girl. All right then. Exactly 26 specs. But why 26? And here we go. Why not 25? What would happen if we put in, say, 27? We put in 26. But why? Ah, Zarina, you're the most inquisitive fairy I've ever known. Correction, it's a tie. Let's just say you're the tinkerbell of dust keepers. So why do you say it like it's a bad thing? Because we don't work with twigs and acorn caps. We work with pixie dust. It's our lifeblood. There's no, There's no room, room for, for error. error. This is the question I asked over and over and over again during residency. Why do we give the doses we give? There's no room for error. Why do we give 60 gray? Why not 74? Why not 45? So there's actually a wonderful provocative piece that came out of Peter Mack as well uh, a couple of years ago where they published a long-term series of patients uh, with stage 3B lung cancers who were treated palliatively with 20 and five who were cured. Uh, with their radiation therapy alone. And so, it, you know, I think all of us know this, right? All of us have had the patient whose who's head and neck cancer is melted away after two weeks. And all of us have had the patient who the same head and neck cancer is still there after 70. And so I think this is something, again, it, it's, it's, in our, it's in our DNA, sorry, unintended pun. It, it's, it's, in, it's in our gestalt that we know that these differences exist. But if we can't identify them, of course, we can't start making dose up, right? We can't just be like Zarina and randomly give a fraction less or a fraction more. We have to back it up with something. And so right now we're sort of blind to this concept. And so it's a lot like in the old, in the old days when we used to give 10 by 10 boxes, APPA, to prostate cancer 
because we knew that almost all the prostates would fit in that 10 by 10 field. But the minute you take a CT scan, you can see the prostate, all of a sudden it's ridiculous to give a 10 by 10 field. I'm gonna to try to argue during the course of this talk that we now can see the heterogeneity in sensitivity that we need. And we now can start adapting to that. So what is it about dose that's been so elusive, right? What, what if we could use genomics to identify those who needed more or less? And so uh, this is a fun story too. My, my second week of registrar training, this paper came out and that, that's my friend Javier Torres Roca, friend and colleague who wrote a series of papers that were back to back in the Red Journal. And they, like I said, they came out my second week of registrar training. And dutifully, I took the journal, we don't do that anymore, but I took the journal that year and I put it in my bag and I actually took a vacation. It was just after the intern year in America, which is a difficult year. My wife and I just moved across the country. So we took a, a vacation and I took the, the journal with me and, and I went away and I read these, this paper and then there was another one back to back with it from him. And, and it said that there was now a biomarker of radiation sensitivity called the radiation sensitivity index. And I came back from my vacation and I came to the beginning of my registrar training and thought, right, here we go, personalized radiation. Well, that was 2009 and it's still not a reality and it's frustrating, um, but I'm hoping we're getting closer. So, so, what, so what is RSI? I'm not gonna belabor it overly much, but basically Javier had this idea that he could use systems biology to go from gene expression to radiosensitivity. And so what he did was he basically took a large series of cell lines that already had expression he did SF2 on them. So he did the classic experiment. He gave them two gray and measured their surviving fraction. And then he came down and he figured out that there was 10 genes plus a mathematical model. So you rank the genes, you multiply them by these constants and you get a number. And he didn't say SF2 equals this. He said RSI equals this. But what it really is is SF2. And I think that's important for a reason that I'll get to it in a few minutes. But I don't wanna belabor what RSI is or what's in RSI because I don't really care. What RSI is in my mind is a series, it's a series of canaries in the coal mine of the overall signaling network of a person's cancer. It isn't that these are necessarily causative genes, although he has knocked a few out and shown sensitivities changes, has changed. But what these are is these are genes that give you information about how the entire larger signaling network is working. And it gives you ideas about many, possibly infinitely many, attractor states which can code for radiation sensitivity or resistance. And that's important because I'm not interested in the biological mechanism here, but what I am interested in is in the veracity of this model in capturing a phenotype that I care about, which is radiation sensitivity. And so over the course of years, Javier and his colleagues, before I started getting involved, showed over and over and over in many data sets that I'll, I'll flash uh, shock and awe in front of you next slide, that, that this index, this number, if you measure it on a cohort of patients treated with radiation, like on the left, could separate these cohorts into good performers and bad performers quite reliably. If you use the same index and the same ap approach, you couldn't say anything about uh, groups of patients who didn't receive radiation. So for example, on the right, mastectomy alone doesn't help you. On the left, lumpectomy and radiation, all of a sudden the groups separate. Javier did this over and over and over and over in many, many different data sites, data sets. Generally, they were small numbers. It was validated across these sites as a dichotomous endpoint. Yes or no, if radiation is helpful. Now, the problem was no one really wants to know that, right? So let's say you have a glioma patient who comes in, has had a good resection. You do this test on them. The test says that they're not going to respond well to radiation. What are you gonna offer them? Radiation, right? No one wants to know that it's less or more helpful. But what we realized when we started looking at a much larger cohort, we looked at about 10,000, around 10,000 patients, we realized that it's not just this dichotomous thing, yes or no. It's really this sort of heterogeneous measure, which for each disease site or cancer type has within it an amazing, beautiful heterogeneity. So take, for example, brain on the top, and so what you see, the, you see a, a series of violin plots, which are all many, many hundreds of patients per disease type. And you see a violin within that that shows you the distribution and how many of them and what their RSI is. And with that, the black dot in the middle that you're seeing is the rank of the median. So the median glioma patient is more radiation resistant than the median thyroid cancer patient is more resistant than the median soft tissue sarcoma patient, for example. 
And so this sort of follows what we know as clinicians. We know that it follows this general path. But what you see also is that there's a whole bunch of glioma patients who have more sensitive tumors than many of the patients with sarcoma or even skin or pancreas. And so there is this heterogeneity within disease that's really important. And this is really the aha moment that led us to the first paper where we described GARD. And this is sort of where I came in to start um, helping. And so this, this idea that the utility of a yes, no indicator is really limited. Let's go back to basics. I had actually just come back to the US to finish my registrar training. And I had just come from Oxford and we had been doing a bunch of uh, rad bio stuff. And, and so I really just sat down with Javier and said, Let, let's go back to the very beginning. So I hope you all recall the linear quadratic equation, which is this SF equation there, which is really just this exponential curve, which talks about how um, a given dose D of radiation given in N fractions affects the overall number of, of tumor cells. And it's, it's given by this exponential curve. And of course, we're all familiar with the alpha and beta, which are these biological, uh, these are phenomenological parameters that govern radiation response. We tell stories to our trainees about how these are biological parameters, but they're really phenomenological ones. That said, I don't care if they truly represent biology as long as they tell me how to help. If mathematical models are all wrong, but some are useful. And I would argue that, that this has been a useful equation for a long time. But if you now remember the experiments that Javier did, he was really looking at uh, RSI is truly an SF2 experiment. So if you plug RSI in for surviving fraction and you plug in one for fractions and two for gray, that's exactly his experiment. So now you can rearrange this equation and solve for alpha. And you end up with what we call the, the genomic alpha. And you take the log of the score and you mess around with it in some constants and you can actually solve for this alpha. So now if you have a patient specific alpha, you can now ask how this transmute the dose that you give. Now, of course, there's a caveat here, which is we're assuming beta is constant. Um, it's, a, it's an assumption, it's, it's not perfect, but for, if, as long as we're near to standard fractionation, it's probably okay. This is a, a point for further work that we'll talk about later. But now what's crazy is if you give two gray, so this is what happens if you give two gray. So what happens to that dose? Well, it, it has this massive range. The effect of the dose you're giving, the effect of two gray isn't the same from patient to patient. Two gray is not two gray isn't two gray. And so as a matter of fact, if you take a peek here, this is that curve I just showed you. So two gray can vary from a guard of something like almost nothing up to three. It can vary over two orders of magnitude for the same exact dose. And so each time we think we're treating patients the same, we're not. And so this is just a scale of different RSI. So you can imagine if you knew your patient's RSI and you knew how much dose you were giving, you could figure out the effect. And that's exactly what we want to be trying to model is really thinking about where along this, this, this uh, continuum are you treating your patient? So let's say you wanted to give a patient a, two units of guard. And I'm gonna argue in the course of this talk that we should start thinking about our doses in units of guard. Gray are what come out of the machine. And you can measure, the physicists measure beautifully, perfectly within tiny fractions of percents. Guard is the unit of effect within the patient. And I would argue that that's what matters. And of course it's dependent upon the dose that comes out. And so being, being uh, precise and accurate with the dose is still paramount. But if we don't know how that's affecting our patient, we just don't know what we're giving. So you could be within 1% on what you deliver. You could be within 1% of what comes out of the machine, but you could be off by 500% on what you think you're delivering. I hope that makes everyone a little bit uncomfortable because it's really hard for me to actually practice now knowing that. I can't unsee that. So, so let's look at an example. Let's take a, a cohort of patients. This is previously published in Clinical Cancer Research 2012. Um, and on the left, we have a distribution of the actual patients in that trial who uh, have their patient had gene expression measured. And this is a distribution of RSI. Now, if you use this equation that I've shown you and you use the uh, N equals one, D equals two and beta equals 0.05, you can then transform this into a distribution of alphas. So again, this is literally just the patients who were treated. And so now we can ask the question, if these patients with these alphas were given 
25 fractions of two gray each, which they were, we can now figure out how much, how many units of gray, or sorry, how many units of guard each patient received. And now we've gone from a situation where all the patients got 50 gray, but all the patients didn't receive the same effect. As a matter of fact, we have this distribution of effects we see. And the question we can then ask is how this translates into outcome. And what we found is that it actually strongly associates individually, but each of these individual cohorts was actually quite small when it came to understanding. And so the power here was difficult. So we still had to really look at cut points, but now we have, instead of just a cut point, we have the ability to alter the effect you get by giving more or less radiation therapy. And so um, we did a, a quick transformation in the rest of this paper from Lancet Oncology a few years ago. And we asked the question, what happens if we gave everybody in this massive cohort, remember this is us 8,000 patient cohort, what if we did the same thing for all of these? And we assumed they got something like the standard of care. So lo low, medium and, and high dosing. What would that translate to? So what we found is that we still get the same clinical patterns we know, but now instead of radiation sensitivity, the pattern we're gonna see is almost exactly radio curability. So if you look at the dose we give, cervix cancers, we cure with radiation with really high uh, fidelity. And as we go down head and neck, prostate, we are still curing the heck out of these folks. As we go down the list, we see less and less and less radio cure. And so this is taking actual patients with their actual expression and putting on standard of care dosing and asking how much effect we're delivering to these patients. So if you noticed, we went from something like guard of 60 or 70, or uh, so I should say 50 or 60 on average median, to guards of in the teens for glioma, and even lower down here in pancreas in the teens. So looking at these initial issues. And so if you look at this as a whole, what you have is this, on the left, we have this kind of cool plot, which shows of all the patients in that 10,000 who got something like 70, mostly the head and neck, and then all the patients who got something like 60 and then something like 45. That's what we thought we gave, right? The left hand, panel A left is what comes out of the machine. Panel A right, this sort of red, white, and blue is what was actually delivered to each of these patients. Now, do most of the patients who we gave 70 gray have a high effect? Yeah, most of them do. Do most of the patients who we gave 45 gray have a low effect? Yeah, they do. But if you notice, there's reds down at the bottom, there's blues up at the top, and in the middle, it's all sorts. So what we think we're giving isn't what we're giving. Giving a high dose or a low dose doesn't give guarantee a high or a low effect. So again, we look at the same slide. This has been validated across many, many disease sites individually that these cut points of high versus low can dichotomize. But what it didn't do is do anything besides this, this cut point. And we couldn't really do anything until we met, until, uh, here's a, another good story. I was on a bike ride with a friend of mine called Mike Catan, who the urologists or Euro rads folks in the audience might know for the Catan nomogram, a friend of mine here, who's a, a quantitative health scientist, a data scientist. We were on a bike ride and I said, how, how can we do a pooled analysis with these heterogeneous data sets? And so Mike and I got together and we figured out how to do a pan cancer analysis of radiation benefit. And here you can see the preprint that's published um, now, it's online, you can see it. Um, and I will say that um, a week from Tuesday, this will come out in a journal that I've already mentioned here. Um, and what, what you'll see is we've taken all of these cohorts, so something like 1600 patients, all these are previously published clinical trials with relatively good evidence categories. Um, the evidence categories on the right, I can explain later, or it's, it's, it's gone. Uh, we go in, in depth in the paper. And what we've done is we've looked at all of their radiation doses, transmuted all of those to individual guard values. And since we have outcome, we can actually start saying something and ask questions about how either radiation dose or guard affect outcome. Uh, the next slide is, is a bit busy, but it's the same information as here. But I think I'm gonna let people look at it just for a moment. Um, so you can see here, the radiation doses are pretty standard. Triple negative was getting between 45 and, and 75, maybe some boost, maybe some other things. Um, endometrium was getting something around 50, but some variation. You notice actually head and neck, everyone got 70 in the cohort we had. Melanoma, almost everyone got 60 with a few getting slightly different dosing. But these are actual cohorts of previously treated patients. We didn't treat them who were, who were gathered. And this is, again, this is the same information, but it's kind of a different way of looking at it. You can really see the RT dose. You can see the patients sort of stacking up where we expect them, head and neck in orange over by 70. 
And you see this up generally, like if I were to fit a, a regression line to this, you'd see it going up and to the right, me meaning that generally a higher dose is generally a higher guard, but there are certainly patients above and below who we thought we gave more to, who we gave less to and vice versa. And so again, what this is revealing, this is revealing this, this tight dosing window. Look at breast, for example, between 50 and 75 and the top, the top breast, not TMBC. And then you look within guard and it goes from almost zero to 75. So orders of magnitude difference in heterogeneity. And what we found if we did a Cox analysis for all of these was that Guard. So if you, I'm going to please concentrate on the, the black um, arrow, the black uh, trees in this forest plot. And this is a pooled analysis. And what you see is that for both survival, the circles and recurrence, the squares, guard, the patient's guard score, how many units of guard they received is, is significantly associated with outcome. The radiation dose on the bottom, which we transmitted to EQD2 because a few patients didn't get too gray. They got something like 1.8. There's no statistical association with the doses they got in either outcome. As a matter of fact, it's just on the, it's basically guessing. And if you do a sham guard, which is assuming the standard of care for patients who didn't get radiation, there's no relationship. So for patients who didn't get radiation, this is telling you nothing. And physical radiation dose, what's coming out of the machine for these patients is not associated with outcome. But when you look at the heterogeneity that the genomics of an individual patient's tumor has, all of a sudden we have the ability to translate that into outcome. So for me, the next picture is a statistical version of that. So these blue lines show you uh, statistically, statistically significant differences as you increase. So for each increased unit of guard, you have a decreased relative hazard for both recurrence and survival. And the p-values are very small, 001, 002. Actually, I think, they're, I think this is actually an older version. It's even smaller than that. Um, and then if you look at patients who didn't get radiation, there's no association at all. And so I think this is pretty strong evidence. And these are two students who worked hard on this. That's Jeff on the right, who's uh, starting his, his, his clinical oncology training next year in Columbia uh, in New York City. And that's Patrick on the left, who wants to be a neurologist. I tried to keep him in radiation oncology, but he's moving on. Maybe he'll do neuronc, who knows. And so what we have is this sort of beautiful relationship where if we reset these things back into the the baseline understanding of, of the specific diseases, you can take a guard score. So let's look at the uh, right-hand plot just as an example. And this is all in the preprint and will all be in the paper very soon. Um, let's take an example, let's say 30 gray, th sorry, 30 guard, a guard, uh, 30 units of guard delivered to the patient. What we can see is we can drop down and look in the nomogram and we can say for endometrium, that's something like an 84% three-year survival. Glioma, something like a 29% three-year survival. Melanoma, 40%. So you can all see how that nomogram works. Now, the interesting thing here is what you might be saying to yourself is, well, you're saying, Jake, that every increase in unit guard is an increase in survival and recurrence. So how come we've failed these recent clinical trials of dose escalation? And I would argue lots of different ways, and I'm gonna get into that in the next half. But, but I think the important takeaway here is that for, this is for any patient, but for a given patient, if we remember, we go back a bit, it might be really hard to get one extra unit of guard. So for a patient with an RSI of 0 0.05, the top line going from two to three guard or two to four guard even, is quite easy. It's about one or two gray. So it's almost one to one. But to get the same unit increase in guard for a patient with uh, even, even a 0 0.75 RSI could take you 10 gray. And so that question sort of emerges, is it worth it for my patient if I wanna get a 5% difference in outcome? Some patients, maybe that's only two extra gray. Well, I'd say, yeah, it's worth it, let's go. But other patients, it might be 20 gray or 30 gray for those 5%. And that's where the clinical part comes in, the decision-making and the discussion with your patient. So really this places this into the context of what we do clinically. Okay, so that's the beginning of the first Oh, sorry, that's the end of the first two thirds. The ne next bit's a bit shorter, but I wanna just reflect briefly here. Um, so I think that I, I'm hoping I'm arguing, I, I hope that I've argued successfully that um, using genomics can teach us more about our patient's outcome than dose alone. And as a matter of fact, I think I just showed you in 1600 patients across seven cancer types, the dose didn't tell us much. Now, that being said, those doses are all within generally the standard of care. 
plus or minus 10 gray. There's huge differences between 20 and 50 at, to population levels. And I'll show, the, I'll show you some pictures for that in a minute. But I think we can also start this now. This is existing technology. This isn't something we need new drugs or new medicines for. We just need the formalism I've shown and we need to be open-minded and start measuring guard on patients and start doing more work. I'd love to see these results uh, validated by others. Okay, so I've got a, probably about, this is perfect, we have 17 minutes till the hour. I'll probably take 10 more minutes to describe one more short paper and so go from there. So I'm just gonna remind everyone about this concept of, of tumor control probability. And I wanna bring up what I think is a fallacy in the teaching that we do. So when we talk about tumor control probability and the maths within Hall, we have, these are cells in a dish, right? So we have surviving fraction. And if you remember, you take E to the minus N times E to the minus N. So you end up with a sort of double, ex, double negative exponential. And that sort of beautifully falls into the sigmoid curve that we see. And then we go to the clinics and we know that over time, both our NTCP and our TCP curves also look like sigmoid curves. And so we say, okay, sigmoid, sigmoid must be the same thing. I'm gonna argue that these are actually different mechanisms at work. And I think I'll show you why. So let me remind you about this aha moment we had where we had this beautiful heterogeneity in, in RSI and subsequently GARD. And so we have this heterogeneous, almost always bimodal, if you look, almost every disease here looks like two peaks. I'm gonna draw these same data in a different way on the next slide. So this, this exact same data also looks like this. So if you look through, they all have these, almost all of them have these two spikes. But, but let's, take, let's take a couple of these and just look at some, some interesting mathematical representations of these. So, so let's look at glioma. Um, if this was a live audience, I would pick on someone and say, what does this distribution look like? And I'll just be Socratic about it. Um, this looks to me something like a normal distribution. Now that makes sense, right? Like almost every distri distribution in biology is something like a sigmoid. So what does a sigmoid look like? It looks some, oh, sorry, not sigmoid, a normal distribution, a Gaussian. It looks something like this, but of course you can have different kinds. But if you take the cumulative distribution of this, so if you integrate over a normal distribution, so let's say now, for example, that the x-axis of that normal is radiation dose and the y-axis is number of patients cured with a given dose. So let's say it's a distribution of GARD, for example, or radiation sensitivity index. If you simply integrate over that, you naturally get a sigmoid. So the, for the mathematicians in the audience, the cumulative distribution function of a normal is the error function, which is that, that ERF right there. Of course, normal distributions can look different. And of course, sigmoids and error functions can look different. So, so what is this then? Well, you could say this is some funky bimodal thing, um, or you could say, you know what? Most of biology isn't bimodal and funky. Most of biology is normal distributions. So, so what if that's really just two diseases? What if that's two Gaussian distributions hiding together? Well, if that's the case, then we actually end up with not a sigmoid, but we end up with basically two stacked sigmoids. And so what you're looking at in the bottom is as you increase, as you pull those distributions apart, those two normal distributions apart, your cumulative distribution function goes from this beautiful error function or this beautiful sigmoid on the left, and it goes all the way to the right where all of a sudden you start seeing two stacked ones. Do you see that blue line on the right? It almost looks like a sigmoid and then another sigmoid. Because what's happening is we're sort of curing the first hump as we increase our dose. And then we're curing the second hump. But there's this middle part where it flattens out, where we're kind of in that valley between the two peaks. And if you look at these different diseases, you kind of have these different little valleys. Um, glioma doesn't seem to have it, but the rest of them do. And it sort of is widening as you go from the left to the right. So, so what if we could decompose these distributions? What could we say about this different disease, these different disease sites? Can we see these expected changes? Are these separate diseases? Is in large bowel, is that data set really like left and right colon? Or is that colon and rectum? What about the lung one? We're gonna dive down into the lung one in one second and I'm gonna do a little bit more maths and show you. So let's look at that left-hand side one. So is that adeno and squame? I don't know. Is it two different diseases we don't have names for? I would argue that it certainly is two different radiophenotypes. Maybe it's histologically the same thing, but it's certainly phenotypically different when the phenotype we consider is radiation sensitivity and radio curability. 
So I'm going to go briefly through this paper and then we'll be done. So we're going to look at how to use the information from ARCs, from, from GARD and these distributions together with the ideas from TCP and NTCP to come up with something like an optimal dose for an individual patient. Um, so this is a preprint. If you guys don't know what preprints are, you should. They're a great place to put your finished and submitted but not yet published work. And in this case, this preprint became a paper in Journal Thoracic Oncology, which came out earlier this year. And so you don't get scooped. It's not a place where people are gonna steal your information. It's a lovely place to share data early and meaningfully in an open access way that really levels the playing field for the world. Okay, so, so let's decompose a real cohort real quick. This won't take very long, don't worry. So here is a real cohort of patients who, um, so this is actually two, I'm doing two different things here. The, the, the distribution you're looking at the picture of is actually a thousand or so patients from a surgical database. But I'm gonna make the assumption that, that that is a fundamental distribution for lung cancer. And if you actually, we've actually done this, we've done a few times, looked at different distributions from different sites and they look the same. So this is just gene expression and RSI. And now let's look at a real cohort of patients who were surgical patients who got post-operative radiation therapy. And in the US, we give post-operative radiation therapy and we're allowed to give everything from 50 to 70. So let's decompose that cohort. Here's the overall survival for the whole cohort, no matter what they gave. And let's break that apart in the same way we've done previously. Let's break it apart by a dichotomous guard value. Let's, let's p-hack this distribution. Let's find the guard value that best splits them. So now we have a cut point of guard. I can't remember what I think it's 28 in this cohort or something. And we know that everybody who gets an effect, who everyone who got more than 28 units of guard is in this C2 Kappa Meyer. And everyone who didn't achieve that threshold gets C1. So now what we can do is we can say that the entire survival curve, that S of T, is really the summation of these, of these two hazard curves, these two um, survival curves. So what we can do if we, if we know this now is we can say, okay, well, everybody in the C2 curve, C2 group, got enough dose, or maybe more than enough, right? So if the cutoff's 28, some of those patients actually got much more. And the patients who got, were in the lower group didn't get enough dose. Maybe they got way too much, way too little, or maybe they just got not enough. So now if we plot that and we say, okay, plus or minus 10%, good enough. That blue line in the middle is the dose, is that guard of 28. Where do the patients actually fall out? Well, only 25% of them actually were within even 10% of what we imagined to be the right dose, which means 75% of the patients were either overdosed or underdosed. So it's obvious with the underdosing what to do, give them more, right? If you can safely, but it's not so obvious what you do with the overdosing, but maybe we could dose reduce and, and what would be, so what happens? Remember this is those two cohorts there. So what happens if we try to combine a model of tumor control and tissue complication probability. So we're all interested in 0617. So let's look at lung complications. So what are the driving complications in lung cancer? The driving complications are pneumonitis, esophagitis, and major cardiac events. And the good news is, is that people, uh, Sarah Darby and her crew from Oxford have done beautiful work on NTCP curves, looking at these events with, from breast cancer mostly. So we have per gray relationships for bad outcomes for these diseases. So if we know someone got 10 gray too much, we can now transmute that into a complication probability. And we can write that down as a pen, what we call the penalized local control or a penalized survival curve. So now we take your baseline survival and then we penalize that by these grade three or worse events. If you do that and you run a little clinical trial and you model it after 0617, we actually get the same results. We get equipoise between the groups or even maybe a little worse. And this is a beautiful paper from Jeff. And so what we also found is this is the real distribution on the left of these lung patients. And there's that valley, 60 and 74 actually fall on either end of that valley. So we would have predicted, and we didn't, this is not trained or anything. This just came straight from the data. So going from 60, which we've empirically found over decades to be a great dose for lung cancer, we catch almost everyone in that first cohort in that first mode. But 74 doesn't even start to catch any of the second mode. So we could have predicted a priori that you would have no benefit from, no statistical benefit from 74. And so basically you're giving almost no one a chance at doing better, but you're giving everyone a bit more toxicity. So imagine the poor patient who only needed 40 gray, who you gave 74 to. These are the patients who are gonna be driving the outcomes here. 
So what we did, if you take your phone and point it at that little QR code in the corner, you can pull this software up and play with it yourself. So this is a co some code we wrote. So this is how I imagine radiation oncology is gonna go in the future, I'm hoping. This is my, my dream. What you'll do is you'll plug in a patient's RSI. You'll order that from a, a company maybe, or, or you'll sequence it yourself. And you'll plug it in on that slider bar on the upper left. So you say a patient's RSI in this example is 0.2, and I'm planning to give 60 gray. Now what you can do is you can actually plug in the actual plan parameters. So how much is the heart getting? How much is the lung getting? How much is the esophagus getting? And what we now do is we can now predict your exact one, two, and five year probabilities. And you can now play with the dose. You can give a little more. So in this case, 60 gray was, uh, was enough. That's the red line in that histogram on the left. This patient only needed something like 40. But if you go to 74, you actually are making this patient harmed. So if you look at that survival curve, it actually goes down with more dose in this example. But now what if that patient had a, was more radio resistant, an RSI of 0.4, and you only gave them 60? Well, now their survival's gone to pot because they haven't gotten enough. The same patient going to 74 now has an excellent outcome. Obviously, I've cherry-picked some examples here, but this is sort of how I imagine things could go in the future. So please, if you want, or you can find this online as well. Um, but that's, that's sort of the, where I'm gonna stop. I think this is where the future, I'd like to see the future lies. Um, the fundamental distributions I think exist. We are uh, one human population. Are there slightly different distributions for slightly different uh, ethnicities? Maybe, I don't know. But I would argue that we need to start measuring it to find out. And every time we measure and every time we think about this, we learn. But I do think it's gonna require rethinking our whole job from the ground up. And I'm too old to think about new things. So for the registrars in the group, that's your job. Once we start measuring this, once we start seeing what these distributions look like, we can start reacting and learning and going forward. Just like when we started first, when we, just like we first started CAT scanning people. Everybody knew prostates weren't all the same size before we started using the CT scanner, but we couldn't do anything about it. Once we could do the CT scan, we could see it and we could adapt. Everybody, everyone in this audience knows that patients don't all need the same dose, but we couldn't see it, but now we can. And so I'd like to argue that we should, we should adapt to that. Anyway, thanks everyone for listening. That, that's my um, lab or a big, big portion of my lab on the left at a recent retreat we had. Um, and that's the wonderful group of residents that I'm lucky enough to work with here at Cleveland Clinic and my chairman, John Su, who's very supportive and Rahul and Suda who run the program and a, a lovely bunch of trainees. And, and then I also thanks to all the folks who, um, who fund my work. And that's me, I'm done. Thanks very much, Jacob. That was a, that was a fascinating uh, talk. Really, really appreciate it. So there's a few questions in the, um, in the chat and we've got a, a few minutes to talk. Um, so, I mean, maybe I'll, put, I'll read out Paul Spann's uh, uh, question and JP, maybe if you want to ask yours, feel free, otherwise I will. So Jake, why are there almost always two groups of RSI uh, valued tumors? Um, I think you mentioned that yourself, this bimodal you know, um, distribution to guard. Um, what do you think underlies that? I, I think this is this is exactly the prostate cancer analogy. Yeah. What we think are one disease isn't. These are just different diseases. It, it, this, is, this is my my hypothesis here is that these are just different these are just different diseases, and and until we start measuring radio phenotype, we're not going to see it because they histologically look the same. But all the things that we've used so far to categorize them are the same, right? So it's like. Uh, it's just, it, this is a new way of measuring stuff. It's, it's a new, it's a radio phenotype. And I would argue that, I would argue, honestly, it, none of the other stuff matters to us as clinical oncologists, right? Like if I, if I knew, just let, allow me, allow me this um, uh, thought experiment. If I knew, I had two patients in front of me and I knew one of them needed 50 gray and one of them needed 80 gray to cure, say I knew that and it was true. Would I even care if it was adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma? Would I even care if it came from their breast or their lung? No, no, I wouldn't. Yeah. So I think that's really under, underlies this. Of course, I do care about those things, but. Um. And and I guess I, I guess JP's question perhaps follows on from that. I'm, I'm going to ask the second one because we're a bit short of time. Um, yeah, go. So uh, he says, would it be helpful to find out the RT resistance of normal tissues in a particular patient to adjust the dose? So if you if you had a guard for normal tissue, for example, do you think you could integrate that as well? Would that be useful? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It would be lovely. Um, you know, I think instead of using, so NTCP modeling, as everyone knows, is really, really hard to do because you need massive numbers. We don't do a great job of, of writing down um, of side effects. A lot of these are patient reported, which we do a bad job of, of categorizing. And so, yes, that would be hugely valuable. Um, and I think it's something I'd love to, to work on eventually. But, but I think uh, the first step is, is, is cure. And then the second step is um, reduce harm. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry, cherry picking a bit because it's short, a short of time. But so Tim warren has got a question here. Um, obviously, you might know Tim um, from I the do. time in Oxford. Hi, Tim. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so Tim, so, um, so his, his work from rectal cancer shows that some of the dominant features that predict response are in the tumor microenvironment rather than the tumor themselves. And, you, you know, do, do you think RSI speaks to the tumor microenvironment in any way or, 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 or do you think it, there, yeah, there yeah. some additional work needs to take into, that into account? Great, great question, Tim. So, so, you know, I think this is what I really like about expression rather than, than whole exome or something like that, for example, because expression is kind of like a kind, final common pathway, right? Like you could have the same tumor cells and we've shown this in, in some of our other basic science work. You can take the same tumor cells and measure their expression and then put them in another microenvironment and their expression will change, right? It's the same tumor cells. And I would argue that their radiation sensitivity will also subsequently change. And so, whereas again, like this RSI idea is really more like a canary in a coal mine. And so I would argue that the same cells will behave differently in different microenvironments. So I'm not officially saying anything about the microenvironment, but I'm also kind of like blinding myself to where they are and not really caring and just looking at a final common pathway. And so I think the answer is sort of, sort of yes, Tim. Yeah, good, I agree. There's much more work to evaluate that for more fully. Yeah, yeah. If, well, you know, luckily I like science and uh, so uh, I've got yeah. a, a career left at least. And so, and so uh, perhaps the last question, uh, apologies for people who put questions in the chat. I, I'm just going to ask the, the, you know, as, as the host of prerogative, have last one last question. So, so, you know, if uh, I appreciate there's more work to be done and, you know, but obviously you don't know, if, if, if you were to have a, a clinical trial that was integrating uh, sort of guard and RSI. Turn your cameras you know, on what, everyone. I want to see your faces. What, 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 would, uh, what would that, um, what would that look like? Uh, you know, would you would would it be pan tumor? Would you pick a pick a tumor type? How would you you know how would you? Because obviously, as you said, you know, introducing a sort of personalized dose is going to be quite uh, dogma changing for, for for clinical oncologists. So so um, yeah, for thoughts? sure. I'd, I'd love I'd love to answer that. I, I would love it. I did say I'll say it one more time. Turn, turn your cameras on. This is lovely. This is a global community. It's so nice to see each other. I've missed all of you so much. Um, so just say hi. Wave your wave to each other. Um, so I think. In the paper that, so I'll just spill the beans. So, so next week, Lancet Oncology will publish that meta-analysis that I just showed. And I think if everyone dives into the figures of that paper, there are, I think it's 11 cohorts in that, seven disease sites. There's seven clinical trials we could run straight away just from the questions or the, the hypotheses that we're generating in that paper, right? That pooled analysis that I showed is seven rigorous clinical trial hypotheses sitting right there, right? So we said, right, here's what the distributions look like. I hypothesize that this distribution exists. Please let's go measure this. And so if you, if you read our first paper about where we introduce GARD, we, we talk about this specifically. So just let me use as a thought experiment and I know we're almost done, but I, I've got nothing to do until half an hour. I'm covering someone else's, I'm covering a, a non-treatment visit from Chan in 30 minutes, but I can chat till then. Um, unless Tim, you wanna go cover it for me and I can take care of it from there. <laughs> Tim smile. Um, so, so imagine, let, let's think about ERTC boost versus no boost. So this is an incredibly important trial that, that many of us know um, that, that took, so this is some interesting facts. It took 17 years for us to go from inception of boost, no boost to the answer. And it took something on the order of thousands of women. Um, what you can do instead of stratifying blindly to high versus low dose or, or, or 617, instead of stratifying blindly, what you would do is you would measure people's RSI and guard or RSI calculate the guard and then stratify them based on that. And so you can either do a two by two design where you give standard to everyone and then you take high versus low, or you could literally just put everyone into a low versus high group. I am not gonna suggest that we start doing gray by gray for everybody, because I don't think that one, the precision exists, but I think let's just think about doing 0617 again, for example. If we were able to say, here's a, what we predict to be a relatively sensitive patient, 
Let's give them all 60 and a relatively resistant patient. Let's give them all 74. That trial, you can do the power analysis. It, you end up with like needing something like a quarter of the number of patients that you had before. And you're also able to finish these trials. So we predict, we wrote, we did this power analysis for, for boost versus no boost. And we predicted you'd need 250 women and you could do the trial in two years instead of something like 10,000 and a decade and a half. And so I think the cool thing is that yes, there's a ton of work to do that involves trials, but I think we can do it faster and I think we can do it cheaper. And when the most important resource we have is the patients of ours who enroll themselves selflessly in our trials is at stake. I think we owe it to them to be doing these trials efficiently and thoughtfully. So anyway, yeah, I'd love to see this. I'd love to help anybody with, who would love to talk about this. Yeah, and, and patients are obviously a very valuable resource. Um, they're the, they're the most need, valuable resource by far and away. You choose them wisely. So look, I, I'm going to just, obviously we can stay on. Uh, as Jamie, I see you've got a question. I'll let you ask that question. But I'm just going to just going um, um, to thank everyone uh, who's coming in. And, and if we could all just thank Jacob for his great talk. Uh, we really appreciate that. So thank you. Um, if there is any, what, so people who need to go, please go. Um, uh, and Jamie, I don't know if you're still here. Maybe you've had to go to another meeting. Uh, if anyone's got any other questions, do do feel free to ask. Uh, um, Jacob had had time um, to has a little bit of time. He said, "Anne, I think you, Anna, you've got a question. Do you want to ask? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question?" Sorry, yeah, I'll go ahead. Thank you. That was a, that was a fantastic talk and great to see hi, you. Anne. Um, hi. So I'm I'm really sorry if I missed that um, in the beginning of the talk. But how much of that RSI is tumor specific and how much of it is, I don't know, sorry, I'm not a biologist, but it's a germline expression. So, so are, are you asking? Um... So basically how much of that uh, does that express a general patient radiosensitivity that might extend to mm. the normal tissue rather than just something tumor specific? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, and and I, and I would love I would love to know. Um, I think that there's a really uh, I, I think it's an incredibly important question, and and one of the hard parts is that studying radiosensitivity of normal tissue in, in the lab is incredibly hard, and so you're sort of because these normal tissues just don't respond in the same way, and don't, our assays don't really work as well, and so this is a really hard thing that kind of need trial results to look at, and so I, what I'd love to do is answer that question the first time we run a trial of this, right? Um, and so I, I, I wish I knew, sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm just thinking like maybe actually your lung cancer or head and neck where we're already right at the edge of our therapeutic window with our recurrent doses for many patients are not the first place we would want to test the guard if we're not certain that it doesn't also you know, tell you something about the normal tissue sensitivity. You might actually want to go for another patient population. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So, so I was in um, Belgium a few years ago at the ERTC headquarters for a, a small meeting they had. And actually we had like a, a two day workshop about this. And we, we actually picked rectal as maybe the first place to start. And I know that's a, something you've worked on a fair bit. So uh, I'd, I'd love to chat about it. I think there's a really cool opportunity, especially in the neoadjuvant setting to learn some of these um, correlates uh, in, in a really fast and smart way, right? Like, especially if someone's having their their tumor out anyway, we can we can do path CR response rates and we can look at tissue correlates. So I think I think you're absolutely right. And and you know if you notice actually rectal's not in our pooled analysis either because we just... I, I did notice. I mean obviously that rectal is on my mind, but I was thinking there must must yeah. be other settings as well. But no absolutely yeah. and it is something we should have a chat about. Uh, there are yeah, so, there will be um, um, there will be material from dose escalation randomized trials available at some point in the future. Lovely, and, and that's really quite important. For, so we, it's very, there's very little we can do with trials uh, of, of homogeneous dosing, but we can start saying a lot with uh, um, when the dose changes. Jamie, do you want to um, ask a question? So, so Jamie Dean's a, a you know a computational uh, biologist. I know Jamie. Like I said, uh, yeah. Hi, Jake. Good to see. Hey. Uh, yeah. Sorry, my internet's a bit sketchy. Um, so, have you tried in your your latest meta analysis doing a a Cox regression, including both the physical dose and guard. Yes, uh, and then in particular, so so, so we, we also have done a formal interaction analysis um, about whether or not radiation was included or not. And um, guard pops out. Um, so in the survival analysis, 
guard is uh, significant. The, the wall statistic is highly significant. Um, and in the recurrence analysis, it's not, um, in, which is an interesting point. And, and then if we, we ended up doing some sort of clever uh, cubic splines, sort of nonlinear piecewise analysis. And um, it, what I think is happening, I, I'm gonna go ahead and hypothesize that, um, that it still matters for local recurrence. Um, but what happened was there's so few events in the low guard range that, that it kind of mushes the statistics up. So if you do a nonlinear analysis, you'll see that once you start having a meaningful effect, sorry, sorry it's the other way around. There's, there's so few non-recurrences in the low dose range that it, it screws up the maths. But once you have a meaningful effect, it becomes significant again. So it, it, it's there, yeah. Okay, and just I the, think I think in the pooled analysis, p is like oh six or something so frustrating. Yeah, I guess what I'd hope to see if you wanted to personalize dose based off of this is that when you do a combined regression including physical dose and guard, that you no longer see an association between physical dose and outcome. It, otherwise, yes. guard isn't explaining all of the dose response relationship, and so I think it's, it's a bit risky to try and personalize dose in that way. Yeah, yeah, and also go for it. So all the data for that whole paper are sitting on GitHub. You could go do it right now. You could do it fast enough that you can answer the question for us before I go off to clinic. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, Timmy, thanks. thanks, Timmy. And, and Sean, uh, do you introduce, introduce yourself and, and ask your question? Hi, Jacob. Yeah, great talk. Thanks. I'm Sean O'Connell. I'm a clinical oncologist and a senior lecturer here in Glasgow. Um, nice to meet you. And, Cheers. Uh, I just had a quick question. I, I think you mentioned it in your talk about the beta um, and how it's always treated as a constant. And I think you said you'd come back to it, but I, I, maybe I missed it. I mean, is there some, I mean, obviously the received wisdom in classical radiobiology is that, you know, it is um, not a constant. So at some stage, do you think you're gonna start working on how you estimate the beta value yeah. as well as alpha? Or do you think alpha is enough to be able to start working on this as a, a clinical tool? Uh, I think the answer to your questions is yes. So I think alpha is enough to start using it as a clinical tool. Um, and, and also, so we actually have a paper a couple of years ago that uh, Cameron Ahmed is the first author of, in, also in JTO, where we used GARD to look at um, lung and liver metastases. And uh, it's sort of like BED, you know, th th they're both monotone, right? So, so no matter what you call beta, the relationship between dose and, and GARD is monotone in RSI. And so uh, at some point that qualitative relationship is not gonna change. However, it's gonna change a lot when it comes to like trying to nail the, the specific dose you need uh, based on someone's beta. And it's also gonna change a lot when you start increasing, like basically, you know, once, once beta D is much bigger than alpha, you know, you're basically, it's a, it's a competing thing, right? So basically who's, who's, who's dominant? So low, low dose refraction alpha is more important. But a high dose effect, we all know beta is more important. So, so I think one, if we're talking about, and I'm always very careful to say this in, in the papers we write, I'm quite confident near standard fractionation. I still think, and so Ka Catherine West um, uh, tweeted this recently, which is cool. I love Catherine, she's so clever and she's been such a fan boy of hers for so long. Um, she, she tweeted, you know, radiation response is radiation response. I think RSI is truly capturing something that in that alpha, which is useful no matter what patient's betas are. But as we want to do better and better, we're gonna to have to go back and start learning it. Um, the problem is, is if you look at the older data sets that we've used to, to derive the model for RSI, um, beta is, it, it, it gets really, really fuzzy. The survival curves get really noisy at higher dose per fraction in the dish. And, and that's sort of what you need to fit that beta. So you end up getting sort of nonsensical, even negative beta values when you start trying to fit things. And so I think we need to rethink our colony forming assays or we do them in a, in a higher throughput or a higher resolution manner. If we want to do the same thing, which is to estimate beta from stuff in a dish. Um, alternatively, I think there's probably some clever ways to do this um, you know, with some of the, the newer sort of machine learning methods rather than a, a sort of quite supervised, um, sort of, I should say, semi-supervised systems biology method. But then we can just get to an entire huge argument about whether we should be doing things in a supervised or unsupervised manner. And no one has time for that. <laughs> yeah. What do we say to the God of machine learning? Not today. Anyway, sorry. Game of Thrones joke. Um. Annie, your hand's up. Do you have one more question? Oh, sorry, that was just sort of a follow-up question to the previous one. 
I mean, this is this is very, probably my very naive phys physicist approach to this. And um, do we do we really need to understand that exact link to you no know, underlying surviving fraction and beta and so on? Especially if we accept that the microenvironment is going to play in, the host response is going to matter. I don't know how many lymphocytes we irradiate is going to matter. All of those things. Is this not just a dose modifying factor that we need to establish empirically? Yeah, so um, I, I saw Javier just jumped on. So Javier, if you want to jump in and, and correct me on anything, you're the master of this stuff as well. But I think I think you bring up a really interesting question, right? So the, the genius of what Javier did was take, and everyone can tell everyone can tell him, I haven't, I didn't just say he was a genius just now because I saw him jump on. I've been saying nice things the whole time, unless you just got, in, in case you just got here, Javier. Um, but, but I think what the genius of what he did was was take something and 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 take the take the curtain away, right? So so I also could see under. But the, the, I'm going to tell us a, a silly story. Do, do you know this amazing experiment they did in Duke, where they hooked um, electrodes up to a monkey's head, and they did like an EEG, and then they gave the monkey a joystick that controlled a robot arm, and then the monkey was like, it did a task with the robot arm with the joystick, and if it did it well, it got a treat, right? And what they did was they 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 let the monkey get good at uh, this, the, the task and it was connected to the joystick. But then what they were doing is they were training a machine learning algorithm to figure out what the hand was doing based on the brain waves. And then at some point they disconnected the joystick from the robot arm and connected the brain waves through the algorithm to the robot arm. But the monkey kept going, da -da 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 -da, doing its task. And then eventually the monkey took its hands off the joystick and kept controlling the robot arm with its brain. And so I'm gonna say this is analogous to that. So is there going to be a moment when we no longer have to rely on the definitely imperfect cell line experiments and we can simply use what we now accept to be a relationship and what we now accept to be a different way of measuring radiation effect and move away from that and go into the empiric clinical stuff? Maybe. Um, either way, I've always wanted a pet monkey, so, you know. Uh, on that note, I, I think we should probably uh, um, draw it to a close. But no, Jacob, thanks very much. That was a entertaining and very interesting talk. And I, I 